Good afternoon, I'm Terry Topcat for clusterview.com. I'm so happy to for Jerome Alexander to be here. How are you doing, my friend? It's Good been buddy. so long. It's great to see well, you. Well, we were chatting before, and it's been about 20 years we've known each other. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll explain. Yeah. I've got a, one, of my, one of my best friends is an, is an artist. Her name is, uh, she, she's had so many different names, KW, and she was uh, looking for a guitarist, and you came along. I don't know why it didn't work out, but then we always liked each other and, and connect, kept, stayed in touch. And um, yeah, so thank you very much for your That's time. Welcome. So, um, you showed me your school report before, which was hilarious. <laughs> Do you want to tell some of the... So this was from your school teacher to your mum. That's a headmaster, yeah. Was, yeah. That was a headmaster, uh, right, okay. Yeah. And I read it and I was a bit shocked because some of the language and the things he was describing you, they couldn't say that these days. And it was no. really disrespectful and terrible, really. But you, what you said out of that was like... With a, they made a comment about your weird, weird appearance, yeah. was that? And, um, but you kind of said you always knew music was your destiny. Yeah, and to be honest, that report's kind of like a badge of honour. <laughs> I was going to get it framed, you know? Yeah, because, uh, you know you should. Because I always had, I know it sounds bad, but I had a bit of an attitude when I went to school. Cause I was just well, like, lots of kids have, you know? I was like, why am I here? I know exactly what I'm going to do when I leave. And um, it just, I mean, there were some good aspects of it. You know, I was a bit of a daydreamer before I went to secondary school. And I sort of got to secondary school, and it was all rough, and everyone's having a fight, and, you know, I sort of had to learn to look after myself, especially looking the way I did. So, and at that time in my school, I was the only one who looked like that. I mean, now, the way I look, lots of people. Yeah. Do, but back then, it was, you know, there was, wasn't anyone in my school that looked like that. So it was... A daily battle, but an important and necessary battle. But it's great that you knew yourself and what you wanted to do from from that time, because most, you know, most people don't and still don't know what they're destined to do or, or you know, what their forte is. Well, my mother was ultra supportive always. You know, I was I grew That's up great. with her mainly, and later on I went and lived with my stepfather Andy Clark, who was also a musician. He played with on Bowie's Ashes to Ashes the keyboards. Oh wow! And uh, yeah, he. He played with Jeff Beck as well, so he kind of mentored me. So I was kind of quite lucky in some respects, not so lucky in others, but you know, um, I was always supported from a very young age. And I was just kind of involved with the theatre as well at the time. There was a place called Greenwich Young People's Theatre, and um, I think that's no longer there now. I don't know if it exists anymore, I don't know if it was slashed, if the budgets were slashed for it or not, but. Um, it was great because that kind. Of, I got to play Macbeth <laughs> okay. at like eleven years old or something, and uh, so you kind of knew you want to be on stage. But then when did you start picking up an instrument, or what music were you exposed to, either by your stepdad or your mum? Everything. Okay. Everything from soul to Motown to industrial to goth to hip hop to punk to funk, and I embraced all of it. I mean, there was to, to me like. Uh, if something had an energy or certain resonance to it, I picked up on it and I embraced it. And I was always very open-minded on that level. Yeah. So when did you pick up? So what was it? Was the guitar the first instrument you learned? Well, I wanted to play the drums, which is okay. kind of ironic when you consider about my dad and stuff. But um, guitar just was easier <laughs> to do, and I picked it up quite quickly. It was something that I sort of in two years I'd sort of. I who did like, you play along to, or who did you listen to while? Well, this is before YouTube think? days, obviously. Prince, quite a lot. Hey. Prince, a lot. Um, then I would listen to like, a group called Death in June, who are like a sort of underground kind of, they call it neo folk, but I don't think they necessarily fit in that bracket. I hate, hate genre labels, yeah. but you know. Um, and just a real wide variety of music, you know, a lot of the New York punk stuff like Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers, New York Dolls, uh, the Dead Boys, television. So you got really drawn to that kind of music? Yeah, but you know, I got drawn to everything. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, then I got into hip hop from listening to the Gravediggers, who are like members of Wu-Tang and Prince Paul was a member. And that, because it, they were sort of rapping about graveyards and demon possession, that kind of got me sort of interested in 
listening to that and I love the samples and the filmic kind of um, the way they could sort of transport film into music yeah so yeah real wide palette <laughs> which is great I'm, I'm the same as well so when did you first start joining bands or making music or writing songs I was 14 we used to me and my friend we used to go and rehearse every night in Camberwell and this uh, guy who was a <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to be honest, he was a heroin dealer, but he was also a great musician. And um, yeah, it was a kind of bit like the birthday party. You know, we look exactly how we look now. <laughs> and we used to go on stage and do shows, but... Um, just the two of you? No, oh, me, the... him and a few friends. Oh, okay. And then after that, didn't really do anything for a while because school just got in the way. And I then got sent to a unit for Naughty Boys. <laughs> you know, which That's was another actually, badge you, another thing you well, it was great because I learned more in there than I ever learned okay. at school. So I would be in there, it's like free to a class, and it's like right. it looked like some sort of scary concentration camp because there was like free arts. And you know, in the middle of and I was really scared when I went there. And I'll never forget me and my mum had to go there to, ha to meet with the head, and the head was just very honest to me. He said, Listen, you knuckle down, you do your work, we're fine. But if you don't, I'll kick your ass all the way from here to Thamesmead. And I kind of respected that about him, yeah. you know. It's like, okay, you're real. Whereas Absolutely. the, the other, guy who yeah. wrote my thing, you know, he said, oh, I'm a socialist, I'm this and that. And then he would do the complete opposite of what he preached. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, I then went on to play with a band called Black Atmosphere, uh, who were kind of like a copy of Bauhaus. I hate to say that, but it's true. We played the Astoria when I was 19 years old. Oh, that must have been such a buzz. With, do you remember Bell, who passed recently? Bell yes, they Star, had a tribute. Yeah. Yeah, he was on he, drums that right, night. Right, okay. And, uh, it was, I never met him, but yeah. Yeah, he was quite a, you know, figure on the that, scene. They, um, David and, and Will um, from Rachel Stamp, because they played a lot with Bell, yeah. they did a Prince gig or something really... East London was really hard to get to, and Bell was playing drums, but I never actually physically met him, but he, he was lo very loved and respected. Yeah, he was a lovely guy. I really, really had a lot of time for him, and great, great, incredible musician, you know. And um, so that kind of went south after a while, because um, the singer went back to the States, and then for a while I was sort of just going between bands. I was in a band called The Scuzzies, which was around the time when... I think that's when I met you. That's when we met, yeah. That's yeah. when we met. The, that, that, the name sounded familiar. And that that's was right. kind of influenced a lot by sort of new, early New York punk, but still trying to do something modern with it, I suppose. Right. And we did an album. We had um, Pete Doherty guest on a track called On The Corner. Is that when you first met him, around that time? We or? met, actually, I think it was about 2001 or two at an Alec Empire show. And my oh girlfriend, god, Alec Empire. My god, yeah. Do you remember? That was I remember that name from way Atari back. teenage right yeah, days. Yeah. yeah. So I met him there, and we were sort of, you know, I was immediately struck by him because I could see he was someone who never put his guitar down, and I thought that was really interesting. That like he was always writing, always, you know, um, had this stamina, and uh, we just became friends. The next thing I know, he just said, "Do you want to support us at the Astoria?" So it was like literally a few months our band had been together. And uh, <laughs> as a lot of people know, that was a night when the riot occurred. Yeah, you were saying. Uh, and, um, yeah. This but was it, a scuzzy support. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So we did, we did a few supports of Baby Shambles and, and uh, Peter Solo and stuff. And then the same when Dead Cuts came around. So, how did, so they formed in 2012? Dead Cuts. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was actually New Year's Eve 2011. <laughs> if you want to be really okay. good. So, right. I know it's on the cusp of yeah, but yeah. We, you know. So, me, how did you meet the singer Mark? Mark he was I in met, the census thing. Again, through uh, my ex girlfriend, Heidi Matakainen, she, she just knew everyone. So, she like introduced me to Mark. Me and Mark hit off. I didn't actually realize at the time that he was a singer of the census things because he looked so different. I knew who the census things were. So tell I, people who the census things that there might be viewers. They were like an uh, indie group, well, not an indie group, I guess uh, an alternative group for That's want an of a better word. Yeah. And they were 
very popular in the 90s. Um, Europe all, as well. Yeah, the, you know, then the musicians went on to do other things like Cass Brown, the drummer, went on to be in Gorillaz. That's right. Uh, the bass player Morgan went on to be in Muse. And the guitarist went on to be in that band, Three Colors Red. Oh, I love Three and Colors Red. CJ and Hood. Yeah, yeah. And, and Mark, after the census things, went to do the Wild Hearts for a brief right. stint. And then we got together and we put dead cuts together and that came together really, really quick. So you know? as a guitarist, obviously, you always see there's super duos. You know, you've got like Steve, Steve, uh, Steven Tyler and Joe Perry, you know was mark that that piece that you just fitted with like well, working creatively I think of all the other previous art yes. singer that you worked with well also he sort of kicked my ass a bit and taught me to not be so fucking lazy <laughs> because really like you know i was quite lazy and i was living in this beautiful flat in barns and like just thinking oh yeah everything's cool and he'd be like no we've got to write four bangers today so every day yeah. we'd write four songs, and if they weren't great, we'd, he'd say, right, we're writing another one. And he was a disciplinarian, and at the beginning of the band, when he had his health, he was full steam. You know, he was, he was a great leader, and he taught me many things, and I'm very, And you very taught great. a lot with them, didn't you? The yeah. Well, what was the name of the first album? Uh, Dark is the Night. And that came and that, out 2014? I think it was 2014, yeah. Who produced the album? Oh, do you know what? It was Harvey Birrell who I think he worked with the Buzzcocks. Okay. He'd also worked with the Census things and just Great a ton of experience like, working with him. Oh, he was a... It was quite funny because Mark would come in, like he'd set... Harvey would set up all the amps and then Mark would quickly run in and turn them on like that. We wanted... <laughs> there was a bit between the two of them, there was a bit of clash. Did they work before with each but other? But they worked with each other and it, and it was just great. Harvey got it, you know, like that. Then our second album was made by a guy called Ralph Jezzard, who was name. in, oh God, Grand Theft Auto. And um, he, yeah, again, you know, uh, that was a great experience. So Hit All Sixes took longer to make, but it, it's still, as far as I'm concerned, a really great album. I felt. So we're going to talk about an infamous incident. So you talked about your friend <coughs> Pete Doherty. So right. you were, he invited you one time to go and play with him in Paris. So tell yeah. the story about your passport. <laughs> yeah, this was really funny. Um, so basically I was living, I was living in this flat that we always had these parties that were gone for days and days and days. And there was always something that would go missing. <laughs> and one day I got up and I noticed my passport had gone. Everyone said to me, oh, don't worry, you know, you just pay a little extra and you get one and whatever. And I said, okay, cool. So, and, Ironically, on that day, Peter had asked me and Mark to do this acoustic gig with him down at the Torriano, which was this pub down in Kentish Town. And so we went and we did it, and Peter was like, look, I've got two nights at the Moroccanry in Paris. Do you guys want to support? I'm like, yeah. And I'm thinking he means a month away or something. So I said, oh, yeah, when? He goes, two days from now. Oh, gosh. And I was like... Well, I said, Peter, I don't have a passport. And he went, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Typical Peter <laughs> Fatty. And I was like, well, yeah, but how am I going to get there? And he sort of looked at me and said, you'll figure it out. And I was like, talking to the band, what do I do? And Mark said, well, you know, I hid under a blanket once and we went through customs and I had no problem. You know, and I said, yeah, when was that? 1991, right? <laughs> it's now like... They're really what, hot. What were you on, talking? Two thousand. Two thousand and thirteen. Right. And I'll never forget. They said, "Look, you've got to go into a drum, a bass drum case, and just stay in there as we go through customs." I said, "I'm not doing that. You know, <laughs> what if I get like cramp or something? You know." Really, yeah. So then the idea was, we'll we'll stick you under the tour vehicle. Had this really nice couch, and they said try and see if you can squeeze under there and I did but I was still like kind of like oh how am I going to do this I met with a witch that night and she gave me this runic symbol which was for protection and she said hold on to that and you'll be fine and I was like kind of need a bit more than that but ironically <laughs> she was right because we got in we were waved through I hid underneath and then we waved through we played the two shows they were knockout 
great gigs, both sold out. And of course, we were going back, which is a bit of a different scenario. We're driving back, and I don't know why, but our driver, I don't know if it was nerves or something, but he was sort of going like, like the van was going like this on the road. And we literally crashed into the customs booth. Oh my gosh. Oh no. And we had this manageress at the time who'd just come out, I think, for a few of the dates. And she said, she was always the optimistic one. If we were like, oh, if he's going really shit, she'd be like, no, don't worry, guys. Well, the second one I heard her say, that's it, we're fucked. I was like, <laughs> oh, okay. Are. So I'm <laughs> hiding under this um, couch. And all of a sudden I see this Inspector Cluzo type come, you know, full <laughs> kit, you know, moustache. <laughs> and this huge fucking um, torch. torch and he's shining it as far as we are now so say I'm under hiding underneath and I'm just gripping that runic symbol and he's going like this and he goes like that and he's sort of looking at me like and I'm thinking he must see me there's no way he can't see me and then after about what felt like hours but in reality it was only probably a couple of seconds he just got up and went yeah you can go and apparently sniffer dogs were sniffing around and they, I didn't see them, but I was told that they were and they didn't. And then I remember we got, I was just so elated. I was like, I can't believe it. We got away with it and we're on the way back. And I said, oh, I said, well, what was the worst that could happen if, even if they did find me? And, they, and the band said, well, we didn't want to tell you this, but you could do six months. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's, that's why you, you did a song about it. Yeah, well, they, you know, that's why they didn't want to tell me. They tell me after the yeah, fact, you know, but it was worth everything. And I remember my mother calling me up and going, where have you been? What's this about you going to Paris? And like, How did you get in there? And I told her and instead of lecturing me and going, Are you fucking idiot. You know, she was <laughs> like, actually, I'm really proud of you. So it was a great moment, you know. So you mentioned about the symbol that the witch gave you. So mm. you also was in a film with Pete Doherty and Kim Fowley. What was the name of the film? The Second Coming by an Australian director called Richard Wollstonecroft. So explain the film and your role in it and we'll talk about a bit about the occult. Well, I made a really big mistake, which was I shouldn't have used my own name in, okay. in, in the film. I'm, so I'm called Jerome in the film, but the thing is it was supposed to be a hyped up more kind of intense version of myself that I had to play. <laughs> so I'm like running around barns at night, you know, doing Crowley invocations with daggers and um, it's snowing. It was very dramatic. And then, you know, me and Peter, there's, we're playing um, an old scuzzy song together on the corner in oh, his room. Cool. And, but there was, when I watched the film, there wasn't really a narrative as such. It was just kind of funny to watch, you know, it, it, it reminds me of that time and I can't really remember much about it, but it was... So um, tell everyone who Kim Fowley was his and what manager, he was like, right? and what he was like. Oh, I don't know if I should say that. <laughs> I mean, a I've real heard, character, should we say? Yeah, I mean, I've heard lots of different stories okay. about Kim Fowley. But his interaction with you? I didn't meet him. Oh, you didn't no, meet him? No, no, I didn't meet him. So he was shot recorded. in the States. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But I, I know lots of people who did meet him and... They all have different stories to tell. <laughs> <laughs> Runaways is obviously the band that Joan Jett started with, with uh, all these other fantastic artists. What was the name of the guitarist? Cherry Curry, was it? No, that's no, the singer. No, no, no. Oh, wait. Lita Ford. The one with Lita the... Lita Ford yeah, with the long yeah, hair. Lita Ford, yeah, that's they were it. brilliant. So ahead of their time. Um, okay, so talk, let's talk about the occult. So you were drawn to the occult. Mm -hmm. um, Without going into too much detail, you not do that now. What what was that experience for you? And and we we can go on quickly onto the imagery that's used in, in the entertainment world and music mm. industry because there's a lot of imagery that are quite satanic. Well, when I got into it, I mean, I just dove head in like I do with everything, and got burnt like I do with everything. <laughs> but was it a mystique thing or, or, or was it well, the thing was? One thing I noticed, the people around me that were seriously practicing it, they were getting everything they asked for. But what I okay. didn't realize was there was a price for that. Right. They always say um, that, though, too. They do, but I was kind of like, I, I think that's all hearsay yeah. until it happened. Um, right. It's a bit like going to the underworld. If you go down to the underworld and you ask someone to shoot someone for you, something bad's going to happen to you of as a course. result of that. Karma, whatever so, you want to call it. So it's it, kind yeah. of similar to that. I still have embrace occult principles, but it's a lot different now the energies that I'm dealing with but yeah it was black magic I was playing with and everything okay. I asked for came true we I um 
There was a group called the Flatbush Zombies, a hip hop group that I was a massive fan right, of. Right, so you collaborated with them. We'll talk up quickly as also about how yeah, you collaborated but the with reason, them. But the reason why I bring that up is because I did a ritual to some. I said, I want to do a song with them, so we did a ritual for that. And my friend. What does that entail? Don't so he. We, don't know. We, were, we were in an um, actual occult festival. Dead Cuts had played. We came off, and. Um, I think it was Jason Atomic, this guy who, who ran the night. Goodness. He had a, oh, it was like a firework rocket thing. And he said, right, we're going to do this experiment. We're going to attach everyone's wishes to this rocket. So I just thought, oh, I'll try whatever, you know. So I said, I want to write a song with Flatbridge Zombies. Now, bear in mind, I had no connection to them, no one. I tie it up, and then he says, I'll send you the video once it's done. So anyway, Two weeks later, we're on a tour of a band called Beach Slang, and the guitarist there from the States, and the guitarist said, oh, who's your favorite new American band? And I thought I'd be like a real smart ass and go, I said, oh, you probably won't know them. They're called Flatbush Zombies. They're a hip hop group. And he went, oh, yeah, yeah, I played drums on their latest record. I was like, what? <laughs> oh, do you want passes to the next show? I'm like, yeah, of course. And then, of course, we got backstage. And the rest is history. We went and recorded together. And they had known about Dead Cuts, which really shocked me. And because yeah. we had Cass Brown, who was in the Census Things and in Gorillas, there were big Gorillas and Census Things fans. So it all came together. And then, anyway, I get the video back a few weeks later from the guy. And this, this is what kind of one of the main sort of things that proved to me this really works. He'd fired it around the corner from where our studio was without knowing that we were ever going to record in that studio. And uh, he fired it just literally around the corner uh, about a week before we recorded there. So that kind of was like a... But you don't, you don't practice that now, foundation. like we say, let me make it clear. That well, you know, I, I have intent, but it's, uh, I don't throw curses or anything like that. Uh, I did at one time and I have to say, I'm just trying to purify my karma and, um, just be a better person, I suppose. So you were mentioning about the occult, mm. and you said that you did all these rituals that things would come true, but with something sort of dark that people don't really know about, mm. there was a lot of negative things that happened as well, and that's why you, one of the reasons, main reasons why you don't practice it anymore. A lot of death. Wow, Lots really? of people around me that I knew that were practicing died a lot, Gosh. Uh, and in very strange ways. Um, it's, it can be very dangerous. It's like playing with fire. And what, actually, that's exactly how I felt one day. I woke up and I felt like I was on fire. Literally, I was burning up, I was sweating. And I called this guy who was an ex-occultist and he says, you have to purify your karma. You have to, because um, if you don't, you know, there's going to be consequences. And, um, I mean, I don't regret having done it. I don't regret having done any of that magic, but I do feel that certain things could have been avoided. There was one girl that was really into our music, into Dead Cuts music, and she turned up one night outside the studio, and I don't know what she was on, but she was clearly off her head. And um, we were recording a song at the time called DK, and I turned around to Mark and said, what does it stand for? And he says, oh, it's Dead Kid, you know, because how he felt as a kid, you know, at times when he was going through hard times. And as soon as he told me that, we heard this, like, noise outside and this girl that got hit by a train. And, you know, just weird things that... Oh, very weird. That are... Unexplained. Yeah, which I just do believe were attributed to a lot of the forces going around at the time. There were just too many coincidences, you know? I know a lot of people will probably go, oh, you know, yeah, you guys were all high or something, but it wasn't, it wasn't like that, you know, the, the, there was proof in my eyes of what happened. And um, if you're going to get involved, you've got to be just really careful, you know. And like I said, it's like going down to the underworld. You know, if you want something done, you pay someone in the underworld to do that for you, eventually you're going to have to pay the price one way or another.
There's and always consequences. There's really always consequences that like people either die or they can't pay, or and then what happens? Do you see what I mean? And you have to, in a way, you can equate that with magic. If you're disrespectful of the forces, or you don't, you know, if you don't protect yourself, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Because I mentioned it briefly, there, there's lots of. Um, dark satanic image, images used in film and adverts and music industry you know if you really delve into it you, you go on youtube or read up on it they're, they're everywhere mm. yeah well i mean mcdonald's logo is basically a sigil it's a an intent and it's something that once you see that logo you'll never forget it and that's a form of magic within itself you know um the Starbucks logo. I mean, I don't want to get conspiracy theory because sure. I don't believe in conspiracy theories, but you can clearly see, you know, on, on a lot of these things are designed to, you know, make, you so or, you don't yeah. forget and right. you become a better consumer. Definitely. There's, there's definitely that in there. I wouldn't say for every sure. ent enterprise, but most, you know. Definitely. Coming back to the music. Yes. So you've collaborated with lots of different people. So Reverend, uh, Reverend from the Reverend Avalon Love, Creek, Yeah, Reverend he Love. guested on a song we did called Summon the Witches, uh, which is a, a dead cut single. Um, and he actually, it's interesting we talk about the cult because he recited a, a Crowley um, passage in the beginning and uh, in Oki and Cool. And uh, after that, then I got a call from Sylvain Sylvain to... From the New, from the New, New York, York Dolls. Dolls. Was he the bass player? I, I was the bass. No, I was he bass the bass player? No, he was a guitarist. He was a guitarist. Okay. Originally, it was going to be him, David Johansson. Oh, wow. Yeah, Gary Powell from the Libertines on drums. And it, then David Johansson just, I think, I don't know what happened there, but I think they fell out or something. So it was just us as a free piece, and we just went into it. And then the last night we did was the 100 Club and... Glenn Matlock got on stage and Clem Burke from Blondie. Love Clem Burke, yeah. Yeah, it was a really great experience. And uh, what I loved about Sylvain was he had this really bubbly personality. He was always really a happy camper and, you know, always uh, very vigilant. And, um, yeah, I was very sad. He, he, when he passed away, it was terrible, you know. Well, Is it David the only remaining member of the alive? Wow. Yeah, yeah. They were very iconic and so ahead of their time, New York Dolls. Right, so we let's just say, let's just, I'm going to ask you if, of the projects you're working with now, because you mentioned so many bands before and yeah. what you're currently doing, and then where people can find you on social media, sure. and you want to plug a gig as well. Yes, yeah, so I play with uh, a group called Sex Gang Children, who are a legendary post punk group from the 80s. Um, which is the great. Boy George gave the name. You yeah, said. Boy George gave him that name. It's all your fault, George. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I was a fan of theirs. And this is another great thing. I've always been able to play with people, people whose music admired. I've been a fan yeah. of. So that's great. Um, to play with them is great. We're going to do the Hundred Club on the twentieth of October, and then we play Temple in Athens on the 28th, I believe, and then have we do Have you been a, to Athens before? I haven't. But to play a gig as well. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Good, but, but anyway, what a great experience that It's going to be great. I got a show with a group I'm playing with called Black Bordello on the 12th. I wish I knew where it was, but sorry, I don't. <laughs> I'll find out and I'll post about it. And um, I'm also doing, working with Andy Blade of Eater. Um, um, we're you said Jonathan Ross is one of their biggest fans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a huge fan of this. And, uh, we're playing on the 23rd, I believe, I've, or is it, no, the 21st, sorry, the 21st at Dash Denge, Where's which that? is in Camberwell, it's like okay. a record store. That, oh, I come um, to that. Yeah, yeah, I'll, come. I'll, what time is do? that? Because I, I do a radio I'll show. I'll find that. <laughs> yeah, do. <laughs> I always find these things out last Because I, I like listening, I like you, I like listening to lots of different kinds of styles of music, and I'm quite open-minded. Well, what's great about, uh, as well, with Andy Blade's thing, it's a mixture of all musicians who grew up on that scene. So you've got Chris O.C., who's the meat raffle keyboard player. Um, you've got Aaron Scars, who was the bass player in Dead Cuts, and me and Andy Blade. And uh, Joni, who's coming in soon to play drums, and she was the first Dead Cuts drummer. So it's like, uh, it's the great. Union, I'm just doing as much as I can, you know. Yeah. Because uh, I feel like time is precious. I wasted a lot of it when I was younger, you know. 
Uh, and hopefully some, maybe some more collaborations or supporting Pete Doherty or the Liberty. Well, we spoke about doing a solo album together, but you never know with Peter. <laughs> you know, okay. We'll see if that comes off or not. So but, where uh, can people find you on social media? I mean, let me look at your T-shirt. Oh, Psychic TV. Oh, yeah. Oh. Uh, what I'm, was I'm not his name? Genesis Purage. Yeah, yeah, he was a character. Wasn't <laughs> he was he? a character. Yeah, yeah. Um, he was connected to a lot of those people that I really liked, like Death in June, Boyd Rice, Coil. You know, all those groups. And I got to play with as well. I got to play with the keyboard player of Death in June, Nero Schneider, and Boyd Rice. Oh, you also you also yeah. mentioned before about Killing Joke. So. And youth and and jazz Coleman. So yeah. briefly mention them, then we'll say well, it was, your social media. What was really weird was um, that was another ritual I did, and then you know because we, we always wanted to support them. I thought it would always Dead Cuts always wanted to support them because it would be a good mix, and um, they knew my father. He drummed on their album Outside the Gate, and. Uh, we got in contact, Jazz was very supportive as my father was dying and um, he said, oh, come and, you know, do some shows with us and uh, and then Youth saw us that night and he said, oh, I'd love to produce the next record. But so, yeah, 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 so, unfortunately... Sorry, Nick's the next record, Nick's the producer, record. Yeah. So, unfortunately, Mark passed Mark away. Mark passed away uh, shortly from Dead after Cuts. that. But then yeah. you've got, you said you got the third album that Youth was mixing or producing well, or... we went into... Conk Studios, which is the Kinks studio. Legendary studio, yeah. It was a great studio. Well, that it was the last inside. time we were in a studio together, and we, we managed to blow out like 14, 15 songs in a day. Wow. And um, we recorded them, thank God we did, because, you know, that was the last time we were together. But I really want to get that out there, and the fans are really eager to hear it. So, yeah. So where can people find you on social? Well, well what just, social media? Just, just Instagram and Instagram. Facebook. I'm okay. very. I should do all the others, but I just can't be bothered. You know, well, it's <laughs> it's like you've got a busy life playing with all these different that's bands. It. That's you know, it. Jerome, yeah. thank you so oh, much. Man, that was brother. so good. Nice thank one. You. So this has been Jerome Alexandra for clusterview.com. Terry Top Track presents.